with knee examination so here we need to know about two ligaments that is anterior collateral ligament and posterior collateral ligament so the anterior collateral ligament will be coming from the lateral condyle as the name you can see anterior to the anterior tibia posterior collateral you can see it is coming from the medial condyle to the posterior part of the tibia and you can see they both are crossing like this okay so and one more thing is this anterior collateral ligament uh, it's a most common knee ligament which is injured and it actually resists the anterior movements of tibia whereas posterior collateral ligament will resist the posterior movement of tibia let's come into meniscus actually the meniscal tear you can see here i wrote it it's a pain with first twisting and pivoting okay now let us discuss about this drawer signs as anterior drawer side posterior drawer sign what are this anterior drawer side is mainly used to test this acl uh, ligament tear if this acl ligament if you bend this for 90 degrees uh, then you can see in the acl injury bending knee at 90 degrees increase anterior gliding of tibia and there is a latchman test which is uh, we bend this only for 30 degrees here we test for here also we test for the acl only in the posterior drawer sign we test for the pcl injury and here it is uh, we are bending the knee for 90 degrees this is most common dashboard and in dashboard injury let's come into abnormal passive abduction abnormal passive abduction here you, you need know, to remember the word abduction abduction means it is away uh, from the midline right so if it is away from the midline the force which is coming is uh, called as valgus force that is the force which is coming laterally so you can see here uh, the force is towards this side if you put the lateral force uh, the medial collateral ligament will get teared and here this is the abnormal passive adduction adduction is towards the midline so this force is called varus force and this force is coming from the medial side so as a force is coming from the medial side uh, the tear will be in the lateral collateral ligament that is the opposite side the tear will be let's come into mech murray test mech murray test is used to mainly uh, check the meniscal uh, tears here here also the same uh, they will be oppositely if there is an internal rotation and varus force that is towards the medial side so the meniscus will be lateral meniscus tear here and here the external rotation and valgus force external rotation valgus means lateral the force is lateral so the tear will be in the medial meniscal tear so that's it uh, we need to know here and next coming to ankle sprains ankle sprains is that this most common ankle sprain you will see in this ligament this is the anterior talofibular ligament uh, this is also also the most common in uh, lower ankle sprain and next you have the anterior inferior tibulofibular ligament this is the next one uh, that is most common high ankle sprain so low ankle sprain is anterior talofibular ligament high ankle sprain is anterior inferior tibia tibiofibular ligament that is enough to know about that now coming to the radiculopathy actually what is radiculopathy is uh, we have a nucleus uh, pulposus inside uh, you know in between our vertebrae and outside that layer which is covering it is a ring of annulus fibrosis actually what happens is especially uh, the posterior ligament the posterior you can see here the posterior longitudinal ligament is very weak so because of that this nucleus pulposus will break through first uh, the annulus fibrosis outer ring and it will go posteriorly so as this is going posteriorly there's a chance of compression uh, actually you can see the nerve affected is usually below the level of herniation uh, for example you can see here l3 to l4 uh, but the affected nerve will be l4 especially so l4 means here the weakness of knee extension and patellar reflex are lost here if uh, the herniation is between 11 l4 to l5 then the affected nerve will be l5 so here there will be weakness of dorsiflexion and difficulty in heel walking and if there is a uh, you know herniation between l5 to s1 mostly the s1 will be affected because it is a lower one there will be weakness of plantar flexion difficulty in toe walking and decrease achilles reflex so these things we need to remember here those are important the next thing we do some tests to find out this that is called positive leg raise or positive contralateral straight leg raise or reverse straight leg raise so what is this test actually here the straight leg test is we raise the leg on the symptoms where we are showing symptoms on that side if we raise the leg we can stretch the sciatic nerve that is the uh, theory behind it and lessig sign is a worsening pain whenever you get a worsening pain then you can say there's lessig sign positive 
okay and you can see the signs of lumbar radiculopathy compression of nerve root at the red spine many causes are like first important causes herniated disc, disc especially into the posterior ligament because it is weak next spondylolithiasis which is forward displacement of one vertebra over another next you have spinal stenosis that is the narrowing of spinal canal and this is mainly age related facet joint arthritis as where bone spurs are formed ligamentum flavum hypertrophy also may lead to this cause it will lead to nerve root compression standing whenever whenever there is a spinal stenosis actually whenever we are standing uh, the lumbar canal will become more narrower so the pain will increase more but whenever when we are uh, bending in that case the pain may decrease so these people mainly bend because to decrease their pain neurogenic claudication this is a leg pain with walking and it improves with stooped or flex posture just now which i said even it is true for the leg also here i also mentioned some other important points like you can see l2 l3 l4 root uh, they are reduced knee patella reflex higher nerve roots thigh and knee symptoms are present actually it is supplied by femoral nerve and radiculopathy is most common at the level of l5 where you can see the weak foot dorsiflexion because it is mainly affecting the common peroneal nerve and the second site is s1 this is second most common here there is a weak plantar flexion that is ankle reflex is lost and the nerve which is involved is tibial nerve so mainly the common peroneal and tibial nerve are involved otherwise you can say sciatic nerve is involved right because these are the branches of sciatic nerve so these are most commonly involved said l5 s1 in the radiculopathy very important now let us see the neurovascular pairing for like which location which nerve and which artery is present for uh, in the axilla or lateral thorax uh, there is long thoracic nerve and the artery is lateral thoracic in surgical neck of humerus there is axillary nerve and the artery is posterior circumflex in the mid shaft of humerus the nerve is radial and the artery is deep brachial in distal humerus cubital fossa median nerve brachial artery popliteal fossa in the leg tibial nerve popliteal artery posterior to medial meliosus tibial nerve again and artery is posterior tibial now let us discuss about the motor neuron action potential to muscle contraction uh, actually first we need to know some basics that the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is present near the t tubule is called terminal cystine so first you need to understand what is t tubule right so for example this is a plasma membrane if this plasma membrane invaginates like this inside it forms a t tubule how to remember this you can see it's like a t shape right so t tubule is nothing but the sarcoplasma which is in uh, so a plasma membrane which is invaginating inside so uh, with this t tubule uh, if it is present near the sarcoplasmic reticulum then it is called as terminal cystine so actually a triad is present in a skeletal uh, you know skeletal muscle that there is a t tubule with a two terminal cystine is okay uh, so now let us understand this process of uh, cascade which is going on here and very important is that calcium uh, is present in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is very important in the case of striated muscles so let us start this first actually you can see here the calcium channels which will enter this cell as the calcium enters acetylcholine will release and this acetylcholine will come and it will depolarize this uh, membrane actually this is a nerve and this is a muscle right so this is a neuromuscular junction between the neuron and the muscle so acetylcholine will release it will activate the uh, you know postsynaptic uh, membrane over here and this will lead to depolarization of this membrane and next here the receptor will get activated that is a dhpr receptor what is this dhpr that is uh, dihydropyridine receptor this dihydropyridine receptor is in turn uh, activating another receptor that is rr that is rionidin receptor and this rionidin receptor will lead to calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into cytoplasm you can see here this calcium is releasing and coming in, out into cytoplasm so now this uh, calcium what it will do okay let us see actually you can see here this is a t tubule i said the invagination of uh, circulama and you can, you can see these are the sarcoplasmic reticulum to sarcoplasmic reticulum right this are terminal cystine so this structure is a triad clearly you can see this is a triad two terminal cystine one t tubule okay and now uh, let us come back to this process calcium is released and this calcium now will come and it will bind to this 
troponin C. Actually, troponin uh, C, troponin, there are like three types of troponin, troponin C, troponin T, troponin I. All these troponins are actually present on the actin, which is very important to remember, okay? Actin, you can see these balls, balls, these are actin. So, on the actin, you have this. So, uh, this calcium will come and bind to troponin C on actin. So, what this uh, other troponins will do? Troponin T will bind tropomyosin. You can see here the tropomyosin is bound or uh, is bound on actin. Okay, and another uh, troponin is troponin I, which actually inhibits the uh, myosin binding to actin. Okay, so this troponin C now it is activated by calcium, and what it does is it's try to remove this tropomyosin, which is covering the myosin binding sites on actin. So when this is uh, going away now what happens is directly the myosin you can see this is the myosin this is actin so this myosin can bind to it in this step you can see the myosin is binding to the actin and here adp and phosphorus are released in this step okay and that will lead to the power stroke so after that what happens is in this process you can see that the power stroke is formed and myosin pulls on the thin filaments and there is muzzle shortening and remember only which uh, segments of the muzzle shorten uh, H and I bands you can see this is a H band and these are the I bands this last parts are the I bands H and I bands only shorten but not the other parts A band remains the same this whole middle part is a A band only H band this green line H band and this ends I band only these shorten in this process okay and ADP is released at the end of the power stroke. You can see ADP is released. Now what happens is ATP will come and attach to it. Okay, binding of new ATP causes detachment of myosin head from actin. So now what happens is it is detached and now calcium is released and this calcium will again go back into the cell but there should be something to take it back that is cerca that is a uh, sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. So it takes the calcium by using ATP and when calcium is inside the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum it will again go into relaxation state so if again calcium comes then this process continues or sometimes this calcium uh, even though it goes here some of the calcium may remain here so if it is remaining here the process will again continue by binding the myosin to the again nearby side actin okay that is a nine process ATP will hydrolyze into ADP and PI and results in myosin head returning to high energy position and the myosin head can bind again to a new site on actin to form a cross bridge if calcium remains available. Reuptake of calcium by sarcoendoplasmic reticulum will lead to muscle relaxation I have already explained. Now let us see types of skeletal muscle fibers. So actually muscle fibers are divided into type 1 and type 2. Type 1 are slow twitch fibers which are actually slow contracting and they are like red color. Their fibers are red color. And their metabolism is by oxidative phosphorylation that is uh, sustained contraction because they are slow, sustained. Uh, their mitochondria and myoglobin will be high but the glycolysis will be low, uh, not low, moderate. The type of training you can do is endurance training. So endurance training which is sustained you can do it for longer time. So you can remember it like uh, slow red one slow red ox. One is for type one slow uh, contraction red color ox oxidative phosphorylation. So for this you can take example as postural muscle spine. Okay it has slow sustained contraction. Next coming to type two fibers these are fast twitch fibers. So they are very fast they are white in color. And they're undergoing anaerobic glycolysis so there's more glycogen storage and they're having decreased mitochondria myoglobin so there will be increased glycolysis they're like uh, useful in weight or resistance training or sprinting so think too fast white antelopes two is for type two fibers fast they're fast they're white antelopes anti means anaerobic glycolysis Example, you can take eye muscle. So you can see your eye muscle, you can twitch it many times faster. So it's having many fast twitches. So now coming to atrophy and hypertrophy of skeletal muscles. Atrophy means, you know, there's decreased removal via uh, atrophy means, I mean, myofibrils are decreased. Atrophy means something shorter, right? Uh, myofibrils are decreased because removal via ubiquitin proteosome system and myonuclear also decreased because of selective apoptosis. Hypertrophy is, you know, where myofibrils are increased. This is because of addition of sarcomeres in parallel. That is important. Hypertrophy in parallel. 
okay if you remember in our uh, cardiac myopathy you know cardiac hypertrophy concentric hypertrophy dilation right so in parallel in hypertrophy and myonuclei are increased infusion of satellite cells which repair damaged myofibrils absent in cardiac muscles okay now let us discuss about the vascular smooth muscle contraction and relaxation actually this process starts uh, in endothelial cell uh, where acetylcholine bradycholine they are agonists they act on the receptor they release the calcium so this activates the nitric oxide synthase actually it is coming from l arginine it is converted into nitric oxide so this nitric oxide diffuses into the smooth muscle cell and it converts the gtp to cyclic gmp and this cyclic gmp activates the myosin lysine phosphatase what it does is it dephosphorylates the myosin only myosin plus actin so because of this dephosphorylation it will lead to relaxation of smooth muscle whereas coming to this side l type of voltage gated calcium channel it activates with calmodulin complex and activates the myosin light chain kinase so this myosin light chain kinase it actually phosphorylates the myosin with actin so this will lead to contraction so myosin should always phosphorylate for contraction and that phosphorylation is done by myosin light chain kinase and uh, relaxation is by myosin light chain phosphatase so phosphatase relaxation kinase contraction okay so like that you can remember this and remember that beta 1 receptors of sympathetic nervous system like g protein they actually rise the cyclic amp uh, it will act on adrenal cyclase it will activate phosphokinase a and protein kinase a sorry so this will phosphorylate calcium and more calcium into the cell so more contraction right lucidtropy is actually that faster contraction and faster relaxation this phenomenon of lucidtropy you can see it in cardiac muscles so let us discuss about cardiac muscle actually cardiac muscle have dyads like t tubule and only one terminal system if you remember in skeletal muscle there are two terminal system and this cardiac muscle is involved uh, depolarized by pacemaker sa node it is involuntary okay and there are gap junctions in the cardiac muscle cells and phase 2 action potential of cardiac myo cells is because of l type calcium channel and this can be blocked by non dihydropyridines and calcium channel blockers sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium release is mainly triggered by radon and receptor same like uh, our skeletal muscle calcium is triggered calcium actually here there is a process of calcium triggered calcium release so increase calcium into the cell increase contraction now let us discuss about malignant hyperthermia so malignant hyperthermia is reaction to anesthetics like halothen and succinylcholine so here what happens is the muscle gets damaged because of this anesthetics and that will lead to increase creatine kinase and potassium so it may also lead to fever muscle rigidity after uh, surgery and causes are abnormal rhinidine receptors so because of abnormal rhinidine receptors there is excess calcium release we know that rhinidine receptors are present here if you remember so because of that there will be excess calcium release into the cytoplasm so there will be consumption of atp for sarcoplasmic reticulum reuptake of calcium so atp consumption will lead to heat and tissue damage so you can understand that if more calcium is getting released uh, after this whole cycle again the calcium will come back so uh, the cerca pump need to work more and this works with the presence of atp so more atp is produced so because of that there is more heat inside the cell and that is leading to tissue damage so because of the tissue damage uh, creatine kinase and potassium are releasing more into the blood so treatment for this kind is uh, we use the dantrolin which is a muscle relaxant so it is an antagonist to rhinidine receptor so now we will block this receptor so only less calcium is released and there will be normal muscle contraction and normal atp release so block calcium release from sarcoplasmic reticulum decrease calcium in cytoplasm for contraction so this is a process of malignant hyperthermia now let us discuss about muscle proprioceptors so first we will see the what is the cause of this actually we have muscle stretch receptors and golgi tendon organ muscle stretch receptors the main thing is increase whenever there is more muscle stretch you can see for example here whenever there is more muscle stretch what happens is you can see here the 1a and 2 fiber from the muscle spindle they travel to the dorsal root ganglion and they come here and they inhibit the interneuron so because of this inhibition of interneuron what happens is this a fiber is going to the antagonist so what is antagonist you can see here stimulation inhibition of antagonist which prevents overstretching so the response is here because of increased muscle stretch we got a response to decrease the overstretch 
and activation of agonist muscle that is contraction so actually here we are inhibiting the overstress because there is overstress this is a muscle stretch receptor and next coming to golgi tendon organ golgi tendon organ is here the problem is increased muscle tension so now we want to decrease the muscle tension so here you can see first the 1b fiber so the difference you need to see here 1a 2 fiber here 1b fiber so this 1b fiber again goes to dorsal root ganglion from there it will go to this interneuron and what happens here in this interneuron is there is inhibition of agonist muscle what is agonist you can see here agonist means contraction so now we are inhibiting the contraction so that we will decrease the muscle tension so that is the thing going on in golgi tendon organ we decrease the muscle tension muscle stretch receptor we decrease the muscle overstretching so now uh, one thing to remember is here 1a and 2 fiber for stretch 1b fiber is for muscle tension so <clears throat> one more thing which we need to observe is the proteins g proteins are divided into gs gi gq the gs protein is mainly increasing the cyclic kmp so we know that this uh, anything which inhibits the mlc kinase that is the myosin light chain kinase will lead to relaxation right if you remember in the previous uh, here this diagram myosin light chain kinase will lead to phosphorylation of the myosin and leading to contraction so if we inhibit this uh, it will lead to relaxation so here that is uh, inhibited by gs which is increasing cyclic kmp inhibiting this and gi is decreasing cyclic kmp so it will lead to contraction because it will activate the phosphorylation and gq will lead to increase in ip3 and this will also for, uh, increase the phosphorylation of myosin light chain kinase and lead to contraction so one thing we need to remember is gs gs is very important it is inhibiting factor it is increasing cyclic kmp and leading to relaxation gi is decreasing cyclic kmp gq is increasing ip3 <laughs> so i wrote some points about uh, smooth muscle here that is cyclic amp and cyclic gmp both le leading to relaxation but by different pathway cyclic amp remember a it inhibits myosin light chain kinase cyclic gmp it inhibits uh, myosin light chain phosphatase how to remember it <coughs> remember the cyclic amp as a so a first one first one is this it is inhibiting the kinase and g cyclic gmp it is inhibiting this one so like this i remember a cyclic amp inhibit kinase cyclic gmp inhibit mlcp that is myosin light chain phosphatase so next you have uh, prostaglandin and adenosine they are activating by cyclic amp they will lead to relaxation and vasopressin norepinephrine and epinephrine they will activate ip3 pathway and that will lead to contraction you know cyclic amp it will inhibit the light chain kinase and acetylcholine bradykinin uh, release nitric oxide from l arginine they activate guanine cyclase convert gtp to cyclic gmp you know cyclic gmp will activate the mlc phosphatase so this will also lead to relaxation there some other points related to this g proteins alpha 1 receptor is related to gq that means it is contraction alpha 2 is related to gi that is also contraction beta 1 is related to gs remember gs is inhibition so both beta 1 and beta 2 are inhibiting i mean they they are leading to relaxation of smooth muscle m1 gq <coughs> gq again contraction m2 gi contraction m3 also gq so only the two receptors which are leading to the relaxation of smooth muscle is beta 1 and beta 2 receptors very important all other receptors are leading to contraction that is alpha 1 alpha 2 m1 m2 m3 but one thing you need to remember by which pathway gq pathway are all ones alpha 1 m1 m3 m3 is special okay alpha 1 m1 m3 are gq remaining are gi alpha 2 is gi m2 is gi so inhibiting <laughs> relaxation are beta 1 and beta 2 continue discussing about the bone formation so bone formation is divided into endochondral ossification and membranous ossification endochondral ossification in the name itself you can see first the cartilage will form and after that the woven bone will form and later the lamellar bone forms so first the uh, cartilage is bone is formed mainly in axial skeleton appendicular skeleton and base of skull so in all these types of uh, skeleton first the cartilage will form next the <coughs> osteoclast and osteoblast will form the woven bone and this woven bone will convert into lamellar bone 
and in adults the bovine bone occurs after fractures and also in pages disease uh, if this uh, endochondral uh, ossification is absent the defect is called as achondroplasia in the name it says achondroplasia means no cartilage next coming to membranous ossification membranous ossification can be seen in the bones of calvarium that is the skull bones facial bones and clavicle here what happens is directly there is a woven bone already formed and this woven bone will convert directly into lamellar bone without any cartilage here now let us discuss about a uh, sesamoid bone what is sesamoid bone it is actually uh, a bone which is embedded in tendon uh, example you can take as patella and one more thing important point is that uh, hydrogen ion and proteases actually they dissolve so whenever there is an acidic environment in our body it will dissolve the bone matrix that is by activating the osteoclast you know that osteoclast will break down the bone so that will lead to of course hypercalcemia because more bone is breaking down and the serum levels of uh, calcium will increase whereas osteoblast is buried in bone matrix and form a osteocyte and this will control the calcium and phosphate levels in our body so now coming to the cell biology of bone you know osteoblast osteoclast osteoblast is actually which is building the bone right uh, it build the bone by secreting collagen and some mineralization and very important point is osteoblast is active only in alkaline state so in this case alkaline phosphatase level will be high why because alkaline state will lead to formation of bone whereas osteoclast will be active in acidic environment acidic environment will lead to breakdown of bone so that is very important and one more thing important is that osteoblastic activity is mainly measured by alkaline phosphatase osteocalcin propeptides of type 1 procollagen so this types you need to see next coming to osteoclast actually as i said it will dissolve the bone in acidic environments uh, and one more thing about osteoclasts we should understand by this diagram actually osteoblast produces a rank ligand and this rank ligand is activating the rank receptor which is present on osteoclast so when osteoblast is activated it also activates the osteoclasts so that uh, after the bone formation is completed even the bone destruction will also start to maintain a balance in our bone marrow right but what happens is sometimes uh, this rank ligand will over activate the uh, rank uh, receptor on the osteoclast and that will lead to severe bone destruction so let us uh, see all those diseases in future uh, videos so one thing you need to remember that osteoblast can activate the osteoclast not only by rank ligand but also by mcsf what is this mcsf it is a macrocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor okay and one more thing is osteoprotegrin which is very important this is also produced by the osteoblast itself why it is produced is to keep the control of osteoclast process because this rank ligand whenever it is formed this osteoprotegrin will come and bind to it so that it will not bind with the rank receptor and prevent the activation of osteoclast so this is one more important activity of opg and actually estrogen is related to this opg uh, whenever the estrogen is present the opg will be present so it prevent the osteoporosis whereas you know in post menopausal females as they are losing the estrogen so this osteoprotegrin will be not present so this osteoblast will always keep activating osteoclast and it will lead to osteoporosis in post menopausal female now coming to parathyroid parathyroid you know the, the drug teratiri parathyroid actually it is uh, given a uh, for the osteoporosis why you may think we, sh we should not give parathyroid because you know parathyroid will lead to hypercalcemia that means it is always activating osteoclast but why we are giving if you give it in a low doses it will just activate the osteoblast so there is no problem so teri parathyroid is that kind of drug but if you give parathyroid uh, for a long time like in a very high concentration uh, especially in the case of hyperparathyroidism primary hyperparathyroidism then of course it will affect the osteoclast and that will lead to catabolic or uh the disease called as osteitis fibrosa cystica that is a problem in hyperparathyroidism where there is lot of osteoclast and that is leading to hypercalcemia now coming to estrogen as i said estrogen already uh, it inhibit apoptosis in bone forming osteoblast it induces apoptosis in bone resorbing osteoclast which causes the closure of epiphyseal plate during puberty whereas estrogen deficiency in postmenopausal or surgical increases the cycles of remodeling and bone resorption so that will increase the risk of osteoporosis so this is very important and next coming to ossification centers there are primary ossification and secondary ossification center primary is always in the center of the bone for example uh, this is a bone okay so primary ossification center will be here in the center of the bone whereas uh, 
secondary center will be always present in the epiphysis so this is epiphysis here the secondary center is always present both join at epiphyseal growth plate so this primary center and secondary center join at the epiphyseal growth plate and they close at puberty to form a epiphyseal line so epiphyseal line is forming because of a secondary growth center coming from here and the primary growth center coming from here both joining and forming a line epiphyseal line now let me discuss about some diseases like overuse injury so if you overuse your medial epicondyle like a golfers do what happens is there is repetitive flexion or idiopathic pain near medial epicondyle and this also gives bone origin to wrist flexor flexors so let me show so from this medial epicondyle this is a wrist flexion right so this wrist, wrist flexors are attached to medial epicondyle so when there is pain even it may affect the flexion of wrist the pain may also pass through that when you flex your wrist lateral epicondylis is called tennis elbow because the players tennis players are usually affected with this their lateral epicondyle of humerus is affected so because of that uh, repetitive extension or back shots or idiopathic actually extension of the wrist extensors wrist extensors are originating from the lateral epicondyle so when you try to extend your wrist you'll get pain there and also on the lateral epicondyle then you can say it is lateral epicondylis so that is a tennis elbow now let us discuss some miscellaneous diseases like a mucopolysaccharidosis that is both hunters and hurlers syndrome are associated with this this both syndromes are actually the lysosomal storage diseases they are like unable to metabolize the heparin and dermatin sulfide so the chondrocytes degrade mucopolysaccharides and this mucopolysaccharide get accumulated hence the name mucopolysaccharidosis so the chondrocyte is going to the death and this is leading to the short stature because you know uh, appendicular bones are uh, also axial bones all this like long bones are forming because of endochondral ossification so first if there is no chondrocyte then there will be short stature and some malformed bones because of accumulation of mucopolysaccharide main problem is degradation of chondrocyte okay it is seen in hunter hurler syndrome which is a lysosomal storage disease now coming to osteoblast activity markers i already discussed this like alpha phosphatase osteocalcin type 1 procollagen which form tropocollagen and collagen and very important alkaline environment lead to increased calcium deposition and acidic environment lead to uh, decreased calcium deposition or you can say increase osteoclast activity now let us discuss about uh, clavicle fractures actually the clavicle is most likely to rupture in the middle uh, i mean the junction of middle and lateral one thirds so here this is a point where the clavicle usually fracture it is more common in children and also it is common as a birth trauma uh, actually it is caused mainly by fall on outstretch and which is also called as push injury uh, it is actually by direct trauma to the shoulder so what happens is here actually this presents as a shoulder drop and the clavicle will be shortened and especially the lateral fragment will be depressed why the lateral fragment is depressed because uh, your hand put the weight on that actually here this is the lateral segment right you can see this lateral segment is depressed because uh, arm is putting weight and it is dragging it towards downward and it is also medially rotated by the arm adductors arm adductors are like pectoralis major so this lead to medial rotation of the uh, this uh, fragment and also depressed so this is the important thing about lateral fragment now continue our discussion with wrist and hand injuries so first important is gyan canal actually in gyan canal the ulnar nerve is uh, affected always especially it is seen in the cyclist uh, and also it is seen in a fracture of, of uh, hook of hamet so in this both cases you can see this problem actually as ulnar nerve is damaged you know it will lead to loss of abduction or reduction of especially the little finger side that is the medial side of the hand and also it will affect the uh, medial uh, to lumbricals right there will be also sense and motor loss of little finger and medial to ablumbricals and also the hypothenar muscle is affected if you remember this is the hypothenar muscle and this side is supplied by the ulnar nerve now coming to the carpal tunnel syndrome in this syndrome the median nerve is affected uh, actually this is entrapment of median nerve between the transverse carpal ligament and carpal bones so this will lead to paresthesia that is a tingling sensation okay and also numbness in distribution of median nerve if you remember median nerve supplies this uh, thinar eminence and this thumb and this side two fingers right that is the lateral side fingers so there is a sensation but the sen very important thing is that the only uh, 
uh, mus muscles are affected but the sensation is spared because the palmar cutaneous branch enters the hand external to carpal tunnel so there is one cutaneous branch of this nerve which is entering a uh, hand external to carpal tunnel so this is spared so that the sensory system is still working so hallmark is the pain and paresthesia which is beginning with sensory symptoms and that there is a sign called tinnel sign that is a tingling sensation on the median nerve side very few perkers the wrist it will cause tingling and there is also fallen manuel that is if you try to flex the wrist you will get a tingling sensation on this uh, uh, thinar eminence then you can confirm it as positive and it is also associated like with pregnancy because of edema rheumatoid arthritis with hypothyroidism diabetes acromegaly dialysis related amyloidosis and may also be associated with repetitive so if you are repetitively using it then the thinar eminence may get affected and the median nerve will get affected actually it is uh, associated with this many diseases and next coming to metacarpal neck fracture actually it is called boxes fracture especially to like affect the neck of the metacarpal bone and especially this is seen in fifth metacarpal that is our little finger okay so now coming to iliopsoas abscess this condition there is a source observes as you can see in this diagram there is a collection of pus in this compartment and this may spread because of uh, blood that is hematogenous spread from adjacent structures like whenever there is vertebral osteomyelitis that can spread to this and also whenever there is tuberculosis uh, spondylitis and pots disease uh, pyelonephritis crohn's disease diabetes immunocompromised all these conditions can spread from the blood to this iliopsoas abscess and you can okay, you can see there's a pus uh, collection over here and this is leading uh, to flank pain and abdominal pain especially the most common organism associated is staph aureus but may also occur secondary to tuberculosis especially there is a positive source sign positive source sign is whenever there's a hip extension then it will exaggerate the lower abdominal pain labs will show leukocytosis because of uh, pus collection inflammation and imaging like we can use ct and mri scan to see this so here in this diagram you can see the ct or mri scan where uh, this arrow shows the pus collection here in the iliopsoas it is a focal hypodense lesion within the muscle plane so the treatment is antibiotics based on culture ct guided percutaneous drainage or also we can do sur surgical drainage